In the first part of this two-part series, we covered the abandoned and cancelled Disney animated feature films from 1931 to 1990. This is a continuation of the years 1990 to the 2010s, as there were far too many stories with even deeper history to try to fit into a single episode. So let's just dive right in to Disney's abandoned animated feature films part 2. With the monumental success of Who Framed Roger Rabbit, it's no surprise that a follow-up film began development, Roger Rabbit 2 The Toon Platoon. The sequel was actually a prequel set in 1941, where on his birthday, Roger Rabbit learns from his human parents that he was abandoned by his mother and left on their doorstep, and is not a human, but a cartoon, which was totally not a rip-off of the jerk. It's your birthday and it's time you knew you were left on our doorstep, but we raised you like you were one of us. You mean I'm gonna stay this color? Long story very short, the rest of the movie had Roger Rabbit searching for his biological mother, where he winds up in Hollywood and meets Jessica Rabbit. Eventually he's drafted into the military and discovers Jessica Rabbit has been kidnapped by the Nazis and goes on a rescue mission to Germany. The story ends with Roger back in Hollywood to begin his career as a movie star, and he finally unites with his biological mother and in a shocking twist, learns his father is actually Bugs Bunny. Ain't I a stinker? Despite a completed script, producer Steven Spielberg understandably refused to sign on due to the film's cartoonish and comical plot involving Nazis. And while the original definitely had its fair share of risque humor and strong language, the sequel pushed the envelope even further. Is that a rabbit in your pocket? Are you just happy to see me? The movie was shelved until 1997 when Disney CEO Michael Eisner hired new writers to rework the script. Disney was happy with the changes, and test footage was filmed on more than one occasion. However, as the production's budget began to soar, the movie was, ironically, cancelled by Eisner, believing a sequel to a decade-old film would prove financially unsuccessful. Please tell me it's not true! <laughs> Kingdom of the Sun was a retelling of The Prince and the Pauper with a Disney twist, and while the specific plot points changed many times during production, I'm gonna do my best to summarize the story. The Pauper was a llama herder named Paco, who loves the sun and spends his days taking care of his animals. The Prince was a spoiled emperor named Manco, who forces everyone to wait on him hand and foot, with a fiancé who doesn't really care for him. One day Paco takes a trip to the kingdom, where through shenanigans, Manco mistakes him for an assassin. Whoa. We're twins. Impossible. No, then I bet we're distant cousins because we look exactly alike. As it turns out, they look identical, so they decide to swap lives, which gives Manko a break from his royal duties and Paco a chance to live in royalty. One me would do the things I don't want to do, while the other me is having fun. Huh. Suddenly, I'm not so depressed. The plot thickens with a witch named Yzma, who plans to summon the evil god of death, Supe, to destroy the sun so she can stay young and beautiful forever, as she believes that is the cause for her aging. To assist in her evil plans are her mummy henchman and stone sidekick, Huaka, who once served as Manko's advisor before tiring of his constant disobedience. This time I'm putting my foot down. Upon learning about the switch, Yzma turns Manko into a llama to keep him from taking back the throne, sending him off to a distant village. She then uses the situation to her advantage and uses the fake Prince Paco to do her bidding. Prince Manko ends up falling in love with a llama herder named Mata as they make their way back to the kingdom, and the pauper who's pretending to be the prince falls in love with his fiancée Nina, and she falls in love with him, believing he's simply changed. It seems Kingdom of the Sun had several endings, one of which had the fake Prince Paco ordered by Yzma to sacrifice Manko upon his return, with Huaka telling him this would bring back the sun. In reality, this would have awakened the evil god Supe, but regardless, the pauper refuses, the sun rises, and Yzma is defeated. I left at the idea writing for Disney characters, writing funny songs, sad songs, and love songs. Another major aspect of Kingdom of the Sun was musical artist Sting, who composed, wrote, and recorded eight songs for the film, which directly tied into the narrative, making the movie a sort of musical comedy drama. For me, so much of the movie isn't working. I just don't know who I'm supposed to care about, what I'm watching, and I'm not having much fun. 
The story of the animation's downfall could be an entire episode on its own. In fact, it's even the subject of an unreleased feature-length documentary. But long story short, executives were unhappy with early test screenings and felt it needed more comedy and a less convoluted plot. With the animation already behind schedule, Lion King director Roger Allers left the project after his request for an extension to finish his vision for the film was denied. They came up with an entirely different storyline except that it involves a prince who becomes a llama. I was up half the night just sort of grieving over this whole thing. To make matters worse, by this point Disney had already put 25 to 30 million dollars into the movie, and nearly 25% of the full color animation was complete. Ultimately, the film was drastically reworked into Kingdom in the Sun, and eventually retitled as The Emperor's New Groove. However, aside from the selfish ruler being turned into a llama by Yzma, the rest of the story and characters were completely abandoned, becoming much more whimsical and far less serious. Well, I have to say, I enjoyed the movie far more than I thought I would. Yeah, shut <laughs> <up>. <laughs> Hello, darkness, my old friend. Much like the original filmmakers, Sting was a fan of the original vision for the movie. But in the end, all of Sting's once integral songs were cut from the film, aside from a few bonus tracks on the movie's album. With Snuff Out the Light as sang by the later The Kit being one of the only remnants of Yzma's originally more complex character. I think the Isma that Roger wrote was more profound. Many hope that one day, the 25% finished animation, songs, performances, and other aspects of Kingdom of the Sun will one day surface. I liked it when I was... What was my old one? Manco. Manco. Yeah, why did they change Manco? I think um, it means... Um, in Japanese. And that's not what bothered him. Um, it means bad movie in Turkish, and they didn't want that. For as much praise and attention Shrek received in 2001 for its use of risque humor and pushing the envelope of the children's animation genre, it doesn't even hold a candle to Disney's wildlife. This was to be Disney's first completely CGI movie, and was by and large a satire of American pop culture in the 1970s. The premise revolved around a nightclub, whose owner Red becomes distressed when the club's once sensational kitty Glitter loses her popularity with the public, and fierce patrons will instead switch to a nearby rival club. Red and Kitty discover a talking elephant trapped in a zoo, and rescue her to become the club's newest performer. Though very talented, Ellie the elephant is incredibly shy and insecure, and at first she really struggles struggles to wow the audience with a disastrous and incredibly embarrassing first performance. However, that all changes with a freak accident when attempting to plug in a neon sign, and she wakes up believing she's a world-famous pop star and rises to fame. There were also subplots revolving around the club's various patrons, a love story between Kitty and Red, and homages to iconic figures and artists of the 70s. I used to design for gods. The story itself sounds innocent, but the movie was filled with adult humor and mature themes, and many of those involved were unsure about its appropriateness under the Disney name. By mid-2000, the movie had a completed script, storyboards of the entire film, rough animation sequences, and a fully rendered scene, but it was now time to screen the movie for Roy Disney. However, after only the first act of the movie, he stormed out of the screening, appalled by the humor, with one line in particular pushing him over the edge. I won't be showing it here, which gives you an idea of how raunchy it was, but you can find it easily online. The movie was immediately scrapped and abandoned, which is a shame because visually it could have been something incredible, it might have even been an animation game changer. Long ago, about 1811, in a little green valley this side of heaven, on the banks of a river, peaceful and free, lived the Harpers and McGee's. My Peoples was the story of two young lovers, Elgin Harper and Rose McGee, from rival families living in Texas during the 1940s. One of Elgin's hobbies stemmed from the Appalachian culture, in which marionette-type dolls and puppets were sculpted out of random objects that would normally be considered junk. Though Elgin has many of these dolls in his collection, he creates one doll in particular as a proposal gift to his lover Rose McGee. When the McGee's new chicken laid a strange blue egg, they all gathered round and the old man said, It's a sign, it's a curse, he cried to his kin, this shameful romance must come to an end. 
In trying to keep the two apart, Rose's father concocts a Blue Moon's brew, a potion used to wipe Elgin's memory. However, the potion backfires, causing Elgin's dolls to be brought to life. The Angel doll in particular doesn't want to be used as an olive branch between the feuding families, so she leaves town. The other dolls become determined to bring the two young lovers together, with some tracking down Angel to convince her to come back and help. My Peoples was the passion project of Milan co-director Barry Cook, and the dolls were to have been CGI characters within a traditionally hand-drawn world. With a budget of $45 million, My Peoples was one of the projects at Disney's Florida animation department within MGM Studios, and visitors taking the tour could actually watch the movie being made. Get a glimpse of classics in the making as real Disney artists pen features before your eyes. A major selling point of the movie was the wide cast of diverse and creative characters, as each was made to look as if sculpted from a specific object that reflected their personality. However, fast forward to 2003, as with the exception of Lilo and Stitch, many of Disney's hand-drawn animations were underperforming financially. Disney CEO Michael Eisner observed how audiences were flocking to CGI animations from Pixar and Rival Studios, and decided that was the company's future, with a new mantra of 2D is dead. What? You were fixing to steal this truck, weren't you? Woman, you've been sipping the hooch again. By this point, My Peoples had gone through quite a few changes by request of the new head of the animation department, who shared Eisner's sentiment about traditional animation's future. The title of the film was changed to Once in a Blue Moon, then Elgin's People, then Angel and Her No Good Sister, eventually retitled as A Few Good Ghosts, and now had the dolls possessed by Elgin's deceased relatives. Oh, that was just Wonderful. The animation was still going full speed ahead by mid-2003, with some believing the film could rival even Pixar's best animations after viewing a rough cut of the movie. However, in November, A Few Good Ghosts was cancelled, and just two months later, Disney made the decision to close the Florida animation department. Later, it was revealed that the primary reason for its cancellation was in favor of producing the all-CGI animation Chicken Little, as executives believed it had a wider appeal to audiences, and thus began the company's focus on computer animated films. In the first part of this two-part series, we explored the cancelled Where the Wild Things Are animation, which would have combined traditional hand-drawn animation with a CGI background. And though Disney would let go artist John Lasseter, he would eventually co-found Pixar, and in the 1990s, Disney became very interested in the company's widely praised short films. Spearheaded by CEO Michael Eisner, Disney made a deal with Pixar to produce the first ever feature-length computer animated film as part of a three-picture deal beginning with Toy Story. Hi, pal, what you doing? I'm Tempest from Mars! Yeah, yeah, what's his butt? See, you weren't thinking of flying, were you? Now just as a quick detour for those unaware, as technically this is another abandoned feature animation from Disney, the original version of Toy Story was actually much more cynical and mature. Disney chairman Jeffrey Katzenberg kept pushing for more quote, edge, which resulted in a very unlikable protagonist, and a story lacking the charm and heart the creative team initially envisioned. The Woody character being one of the most repellent things you've ever seen on screen. I mean, you couldn't watch it. And it went on and on and on and on and on and on, and I was fast forwarding through it and thinking, oh my god, this will never end. After screenings of the entire film in the form of storyboards and rough animatics, the production was shut down. So Pixar decided to make one last effort to rework the film as originally envisioned, and the rest is history. To infinity and beyond! Toy Story was a massive success and changed the animation industry forever, so Disney extended the deal to five animated features, and eventually a sixth. Fast forward to 2004, as with the upcoming release of The Incredibles, the two companies began a very heated dispute over a new contract. Disney CEO Michael Eisner rejected the new terms by Pixar owner Steve Jobs, so it was announced that after the release of Cars, the partnership would come to an end. So in part as a bargaining chip and backup plan from Eisner, Circle 7 Animation was founded with the sole purpose of creating direct-to-video sequels of Disney-owned Pixar films. 
There was Monsters Inc. 2 Lost in Scaradise, where Mike and Sully travel to the human world to give Boo a birthday present, only to find out she had moved, and shenanigans ensue. Toy Story 3 had a plot where Buzz Lightyear begins to malfunction, and is sent to the factory where he was built in Taiwan, only for the other toys to discover there's a massive recall. The toys ship themselves to Taiwan to rescue Buzz, who meets other toys from around the world that were also recalled, and shenanigans ensue. It seems that Buzz Lightyear would have had a major identity crisis in his broken state, with the situation becoming so severe that the other toys have to bring him back to life. There was also a Finding Nemo sequel, and according to the script, the movie revolved around Nemo searching for his long-lost brother Remy, and when their father Merlin is captured, they work together to save him. It hit me that the characters that were in the parade all came from films that had been made prior to the mid-90s, except for some of the Pixar characters. I felt that I needed to think even more out of the box than I had been thinking, and uh, I had a much greater sense of urgency. With the replacement of Michael Eisner with Bob Iger in 2005, who saw Pixar's incredible value to the company, he reached out to Steve Jobs and the two worked out a new deal to satisfy both parties. So all of the titles in development by Circle 7 Animation were abandoned, but with the supposed two years going into these abandoned Disney sequels, it's possible more visuals will one day surface. According to Disney, Frady Cat was the story about a chubby house cat with frayed nerves, who's torn off his comfy couch and dropped smack dab in the middle of a Hitchcockian thriller when he's accused of a kidnapping crime he didn't commit. With the help of his friends, they set out to clear his name, and the animation was to be a legitimate action comedy with plenty of homages to the films of Alfred Hitchcock. Freddy Cat was to be directed by Ron Clements and John Musker, the directors behind massive hits such as The Little Mermaid, Hercules, and Aladdin. Very little exists beyond concept art, but according to those at Disney, storyboards of the entire film were screened to very high praise. Unfortunately, according to theme park historian Jim Hill, some executives decided to badmouth the film, allegedly going as far as calling the movie a tribute to an old fat and dead movie director who no one remembers. So the movie was cancelled, despite the clever concept and well-received storyboard screenings, making this one of Disney's most promising abandoned animated films. For anyone familiar with Disney in the 1990s to early 2000s, you're probably also familiar with the company's obsession with straight-to-video feature-length animated sequels. But for as many as that were released, plenty were cancelled midway through production. Now we'll be covering the rise and fall of Disney Toon Studios as a whole in a future episode. However, two of the abandoned animations that came closest to reality were The Aristocats 2 and Dumbo 2. Now, experience the all-new adventure of a lifetime as the classic story continues. Join us for a sneak peek behind the scenes of the production of Walt Disney's Dumbo 2. Dumbo 2 was set one day after the events of the original Dumbo, where long story short, a train car with Dumbo and other animals becomes disconnected, and they find themselves in New York City. Learning the true meaning and importance of friendship, Dumbo and his new pals join together to find their way back home. Dumbo, for action beyond the call of duty, I hereby make you a sort of official, almost for real, member of the gang. If that sounds less than thrilling, you're not alone, but Dumbo 2 was about as close to being released as any of the ones mentioned thus far. More than likely due to concerns over the story, the sequel was delayed, then revived, then delayed again many, many times. In 2006, Dumbo 2 was finally put out of its misery by John Lasseter, once he gained the status of the head of Walt Disney Animation. The evil bad man got Timothy. The Aristocats 2 would have been fairly similar to the original, only this time taking place on a cruise ship around Christmas with a maniacal jewel thief. Deck the ship with gems and jewelry, fa la 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 la. The movie was initially written and designed as a traditionally hand drawn animation, but midway through production, executives decided to convert it to CGI. Ultimately, due to story problems, a rushed production, and Disney feeling the movie wouldn't reach a wide enough audience, The Aristocats 2 was cancelled, despite a significant amount of money already being put into the project. Boy, some Christmas, hey, Duchess? <laughs> Indeed. Merry Christmas, Thomas. Hmm. 
American Dog was about a world-famous television star, who as the title implies is a dog named Henry. Through shenanigans, he ends up becoming lost in the state of Nevada, all the while believing he's still in a TV episode, and with the help of a one-eyed cat and radioactive rabbit, makes his way back home. At least, this was the initial vision for the animation, as after a series of screenings in 2006, the original director who had previously directed the massively successful Lilo and Stitch was fired. Supposedly, he was unwilling to make story changes as suggested by the new head of Disney Animation, John Lasseter, so the movie was reworked into Bolt, despite having been heavily advertised in the theme parks as American Dog. The Shadow King was to be another stop-motion animated film from Henry Selick, the director of The Nightmare Before Christmas and Coraline. The premise was about an orphan who came into the world with an apparent birth defect, resulting in unusually large hands, which he hides from the world due to bullying. One day, he encounters a living shadow girl who teaches him to make amazing shadow puppets that come to life, becoming weapons in a fight against an evil monster. You know, the world's gonna rip you apart! <laughs> What's wrong with you? What makes this one particularly odd is that Disney had already spent a reported $50 million on the movie, and as you can imagine given that number, quite a bit of work had already gone into the animation. Supposedly, the movie was shelved due to budget concerns and creative differences, but while Disney allowed the director to shop the project around, so far it's yet to see the light of day. King of the Elves was based on the 1953 fantasy short story of the same name, in which a group of elves name a local human their king after saving them from an evil troll. The animated feature was to be released in 2012, but the movie was put on hold due to story problems and cancelled about a year into production. The animation was on and off again for several years, but ultimately never saw the light of day, but it's entirely possible another studio will one day bring it back to life. At last, we arrive to our final abandoned Disney film, Gigantic. Based off the English folktale Jack and the Beanstalk, the animation was initially titled Giants, but assuming your memory serves you well, it was eventually cancelled for unknown reasons. This one's even more bizarre, given the fact that so much was made of it in 2015 at D23, not to mention the Easter egg in Zootopia the following year, but maybe we'll get a full story of its cancellation later down the road. And now for a few short bonus stories that overlap the timelines of the others. Initially, Treasure Planet wasn't just to be a standalone film, but part of a new Disney franchise. So as production finished on the first entry, pre-production began on the second, simply known as Treasure Planet 2. The film's new villain was Ironbeard, as voiced by William Defoe, and according to those who worked on the film, development lasted at least six months. There were also plans for a Treasure Planet television series to follow the sequel. However, the day after Treasure Planet released into theaters, the sequel was cancelled due to its reception and poor box office his performance. Supposedly, William Defoe was literally on the way to the recording studio when executives canceled the movie. But you can't do this to me. You know how much I sacrificed? Mort was novel number four of Terry Pratchett's ongoing Far Too Many to Show Here Discworld series, telling the story about the apprentice of death who rescues a princess from an assassination and changes fate forever. Disney was allegedly pretty serious about adapting the novel, but author Terry Pratchett wanted them to option the entire franchise and sell Mort as part of a package. Some executives were already nervous about the depiction of death as a main character in a Disney film, so ultimately the deal fell through. A few years back, it was announced as in development by another studio, but its current state is unknown. Disney's adaptation of Don Quixote has been a constant on and off project at Disney going all the way back to the 1940s. Supposedly, it's still in the works, but would not be a direct adaptation or the mature film as initially envisioned. Another abandoned animation that goes a ways back is The Emperor's Nightingale, or just The Nightingale, and was a story Disney began developing all the way back in the 1930s. The project was revived and abandoned time and time again, from a segment in the previously explored Musicana to a promising revival in the early 2000s. However, with a new emphasis on 3D films, it was again abandoned. 
Well, I hope you all enjoyed this little series, and leave a comment down below if you want to see more of them in the future. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Yesterworld.